Sorry, Lester, but I am the chair of the Department of Global Development, and I am delighted to introduce Professor Baker today. Um, he is a professor emeritus in the Department of Government. He's also an international professor emeritus in the Department of Global Development. Um, I'm not going to recite lots of facts about his career <laughs> or his CV. I think you can look that information up online, and I would really encourage you to look that information up online. But I want to say two things about him uh, that I think are particularly remarkable. Um, one is that he's always been, and he continues to be, extremely prolific as an author. He's written and edited dozens of books, and he continues uh, to do this work. I brought this along. This is the second edition of Biological Approaches to Regenerative Soil Systems, which he co-edited with Professor Janet Teams, who some of you might know from SIPS. Um, this just came out this year, in 2024. The other point I want to make about uh, Professor Uphoff, which I think is the, the more the most important one, um, is that uh, he is, and I'm going to sound hyperbolic, but I don't think I am. I think he is one of the most intellectually engaged and engaging people that I know. When you go to take a look at his CV, um, what you will get from it, if you just sort of follow it, is um, a sense of how he thinks. And you, you have a real sense of sort of following an intellectual trail. And that trail is completely unbounded by discipline or by geography or by topic or by scale. Um, and I think that really sets him apart from so many people. We talk about interdisciplinarity, but I think uh, Professor Uphoff is, is one of, is probably the most interdisciplinary person uh, that I know. Um, so he's moved from the study of political institutions and how different institutional formations matter to sustainable development outcomes, which is a topic that's, of course, very germane to political science and political scientists, to studies of uh, farmer and community participation in things like water management and irrigation systems. He has a whole range of work on water management and irrigation systems themselves. And from there, he moves to microbiology and sort of plant soil uh, microbial interactions. And from there, to work on agroecology and sort of the nexus of agricultural production systems, um, environmental or ecological outcomes and food security, to work on natural resource management, and finally, uh, to work on the system of rice intensification or SRI, which is. I think where he has really settled in and where he has probably dwelled the longest. Um, and this is what you're going to hear about today, but I think it's important to understand that that's the culmination of long engagement with rural communities um, and sustainable, like a whole set of sustainable development of questions. So uh, Professor Uphoff has written extensively on SRI. He's one of the world's leading experts on the topic. Um, he spearheaded the development of what I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the most comprehensive database on SRI um, that exists. We are very happy and very proud to host it in global development. Um, that database is a, a reference and a resource for farmers, and including small, small holder farmers around the world. He's been a really tireless advocate for SRI, and he has friends and followers in every corner of the world who've learned from him and who uh, correspond with him about their trials and their experiments with SRI. And so his knowledge is based not just on the published literature or on academic studies, but is also grounded, I think, in farmer experiments. So it's really a treat to have him here today to talk about Reflections on opportunities with and resistance to the system of rice intensification. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming him to the Perspectives and Global Development Center. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Are you able to hear this? Okay. Um, thought you were just simply going to describe me as undisciplined, uh, which some would probably say. Uh, I thought the statistic you were going to comment is that I had been in three colleges of Cornell during my 50 years of teaching here. I started arts and sciences in 1970, 
moved to Cal's in 1990. And then when I formally retired at age 65 in 2005, I moved into human ecology with SEPA. I'm glad that my colleague Pete Laux here, who's an engineer who also was one of our core faculty at SEPA. So I, I, I've moved around quite a bit. I must give credit for our database, not take credit, but rather give it to Lucy Fisher, who my close colleague here, who unfortunately is, is not in Ithaca right now, but she's, she's out there somewhere in cyberspace. And Lucy and I are the core of what we call Sri Rice, the International Center for SRI Network and Resource Support. Uh, but I won't go into that. Um, uh, when Laurie suggested a, a talk, it would be a sharing of experience and ideas uh, from the uh, last 30 years. I learned about SRI just a little over 30 years ago. It took me three years to accept it as being for real because I was trained in political science. What did I know about rice? But I was seeing and hearing things and getting data which just didn't make any sense according to what I had learned about the Green Revolution approach uh, to agriculture and development. And so I'm going to talk a bit about how sort of the, the real world intruded upon my more nicely constructed understanding of how things work. Uh, Eli, you're just going to push a button somewhere or, uh, or I don't have a circuit, maybe. I can do it myself, I'm glad to do it. I want to start with a few pictures because SRI is a very visual subject, as you'll see. Then I'll briefly review what is SRI and what are its in impacts. I want to note some initial critiques of SRI, commenting more as, as cautions and rebuttals, and then go into interesting questions for research, which I hope will engage uh, some of you, and then close with some reflections on uh, development studies. Let's see how this works. This is you know, pointed the wrong way. You can tell how old I am by how the I manage. Let's move it ahead, yeah. I can summarize SRI in a single sentence. SRI practices illicit or productive phenotypes from a given crop genotype. Many of you are probably not in agricultural sciences, but you all should know the word phenotype and genotype. When I first learned from Susan Ria about 20 years ago, uh, it really was a revelation for me. Uh, and it's really terribly important, I think, for uh, uh, everyone to know it. The genotype is genetic potential that any organism from amoeba up to sunflowers and beyond. I would have the phenotype is a phenomenon. You know, what actually results from that genotype in interaction with its environment. That's so what SRI practices to do is create a more beneficent growing environment for the genotype so it becomes a bigger and better phenotype. This picture was one of the first, you know, aha moments for me, sent by our good colleague in Cuba who happened to graduate from Cal's in 1958. So she's even older than I am. And uh, she was a, professor, a student of David Pimentel's when she was here at uh, Cal's. And one time when David was in Cuba, when the National Geographic Society meeting, he had, had drinks with her one evening and she had just been asked, having retired from the Ministry of uh, Sugar, uh, to try to guarantee the food security of all the 600,000 employees and family members of the Ministry of Sugar under a new autoconsumo policy of the Castro regime. And she said, Cubans don't eat sugar, they eat rice. And Lasso, said, what am I gonna, what am I gonna do to you know, get enough rice? And he said, ah, my friend Norman's working with this system in Madagascar, right? To he, she did, he formed a very uh, close friendship by email. That picture is of two rice plants of the same age, both seeded 52 days before the picture, and the same variety, so same genotype, Vietnamese variety. And this farmer, Luis Romero, is holding two plants. He planted at the same time in the same nursery, 
And the one on the right is an SRI grown plant, which you took out as a 13 day seedling, plant a wide space, a lot of soil aeration, soil organic matter. And the one left he'd left in the nursery because they usually plant about 50, 55 days after trans sowing in Cuba. So those are since sister plants. One is five tillers, one is 43 tillers. And you can imagine what a bombshell that was for me. Um, and uh, I visited him, I visited him four times now. Uh, he shows, I started telling him about plant roots. And you see those roots, he said, ah, he went out there to steal and dug up. And then, sure enough, you can see that. I knew that people in the day of Photoshopping don't believe still images. So I sent Rena uh, a Super 8 camera to take a video. So the next season went every week. And so the, the uh, links you have on the right are on our website. You can watch Rena visiting Luis every week, one's in Spanish, one's in English, and just see how these plants develop week by week by week. So, you know, this is not a Photoshop. I think these are two actual plants. I and mean, you can see it made a big impression on me, and I think it'll make a big impression on you. These are two more examples of successful SRI types. On the left, we see two plants in the Punjab that one of our uh, colleagues sent uh, from there. On the right is a plant that's my wife, Marguerite, who's with us today, and I have seen and held in our hands. We visited a SRI training center run by a tobacco company in Indonesia. And the farmers brought us this big wooden box. And we all know one of these you know, buffalo and gifts to take back when they're all you know, fully loaded. We open up and there's this plant. There's some of them, 223 tillers grown from a single seed. And uh, more than that, just like the root system. That plant has. And so, the potential that, that genotype had with the right growing conditions, spacing, aeration, so organic matter, exposure to sunlight, good air circulation, et cetera, could induce a uh, given genotype. There's a picture sent by a colleague at the Al Nishkab Rice Research Station in Iraq, close to Najaf, a name you might know for it. News and they were doing varietal tests with SRI methods, timing, spacing, and all that to each pair of conventional methods being used on the right. And so they're testing the different varieties to see which would respond by most of these managing methods. When you see pictures like this, some things there. And now the question is how can we understand this? We found out fairly early that in fact also these ideas and methods to be used in other crops. In this case, we have a finger millet, a uh, picture sent from Jharkhand State in India. The plant on the right is a traditional variety with local methods. The middle is an improved variety with local methods, A404. And you see, you know, the improvement of genes can give you a better, larger, healthier plant. On the left is an improved variety with SRI management. And I got sent this picture by a student who's coming to do an MPS degree with Ford Foundation support saying, here's what our farmers have found using ideas with uh, a mill. A few weeks later, I got this picture from Angra, the Andhra Pradesh Agricultural uh, University, where some researchers there had tried millet seed with SRI timing and spacing. We saw the same effect that seed, these are two different varieties. Seedlings transplanted 21 days give you the kind of root development. And on the right, about at 10 or at 15 days, young seedlings give you a much more uh, effective uh, growth. Anyway, what is SRI? I say it's a set of agroecologically based principles and practices that can improve the performance of rice and other crops. It's more a methodology than a technology. We resist quality technology because it's not finished yet. It's still developing. Uh, and it's really ideas rather than any particular material inputs. Same seeds, same soil, less water, 
less uh, certainly less fertilizer, but we do add more compost and other organic matter. This is developed in Madagascar in the 1980s by Father Henri de Lalonie, a Jesuit who lived there in Madagascar from 61 to 95. He had studied agriculture before he entered French Jesuit Seminary in 1941 and graduated just as the war was ending. For several years he taught and did whatever Jesuits do in France, I don't really know. Uh, but then in 1961, he was sent to Madagascar as an agricultural advisor. Uh, there were no institutions for research. French had done almost no institutional development. Uh, so he worked for farmers, observed, tested things out. And as he liked to say, one of his articles, he considered the rice plant mon met, my master, my teacher, learning from the plant. What did it like best? And uh, in 1994, the Cornell Institute for International Institute for Food, Agriculture, and Development uh, had been asked by the USAID mission in Madagascar to help it implement a project to protect the vulnerable rainforest ecosystem around Ranamathan. And we had to give farmers alternative to their slash emerging cultivation that was impeaching upon the uh, rainforest. Our first morning in the field, John Dennis and I said, yeah, we've got to raise these farmers' rice yields only two tons per hectare, even with irrigation. But these are terrible soils. North Carolina State has done a PhD thesis on the soils in the region and said these are some of the worst soils they've ever analyzed anywhere. Very acid, people in 8 to 5 pH, low to very low cation exchange capacity in all horizons, and available phosphorus, so only three to four parts per million, which is less than half what they usually think is necessary for a decent crop. We have at least 10 parts per million since three to four. Um, and so with fertilizers and new varieties, NC State was able to get average a yield of three tons per hectare. And his best on farm crop was five tons, so that was possible. Uh, we started working with an NGO set up by Father Longier called Associated Chef of China. Um, and we said, we've got to get those yields up from two tons per hectare. President of the NGO, I, I still can see it. He said, not a problem. You all know that, no problem. Uh, it wasn't boasting. He said, you make it. Ten or fifteen hundred hectares without new seeds, without fertilizers, less water. And uh, I remember saying to him, "Let's talk about ten or fifteen years. No one at Cornell is going to believe that. That's not. Do they know I'm a social scientist? They can scam me. You know, the Green Revolution required new seeds, fertilizer, more water. They're not doing any of those. They're going to ten or fifteen times. We only get eighteen. But anyway, I said, we get three or four times, we'll be happy. Okay. We weren't posted. He said, oh, okay, that's, that's easy. Um, but it turned out we waited three years before we drew conclusions. But for three years, we had over eight tons average for these farmers, first 38 and then 68 and 78 or whatever. You know. And it was just incredible to see these kinds of plants. Um, still, a lot of people didn't believe it. Even they saw it. It's oh, um, you know, three years or eight tons. It's not Manor. And Eric Fernandez, who used to be a teacher here in our farm and soil and agronomy, Eric went out there on the Anglo Forestry Summit for a project. And they took him to one of the better SRI fields. He did a proper crop cutting and take a square meter, cut it, thrash it, weigh it. And then about 2,000 per ton per year. And we got 1.3 ton kilograms from wine per year, which is a 50 and a half ton yield if you detect those on the field. And Eric's, you know, PhD in the Gondi from the North Carolina State. And I talked to him very much in India, probably his grandparents grew rice. He knew what he would see. He didn't dare talk about it here, though. He wasn't paid. Well, he just said, that for himself. Anyway, in 1996 97, we put Eric's picture of a farmer 
uh, on the cover of our CVAD report. And uh, uh, that's awesome. I'm looking down, you know, the picture. Jill Bear was getting And Eric has spent time with him, watched his operation. Almost no one paid any attention to this, but they keep that in mind. That's one of the ones give me a part of my story. Olivia Vent, who's also one of our four for SRI, got this wonderful letter from the farmer in Punjab. And he goes, Dear Madam, I was much enthused by your very um, prompt reply to my request about system rights certification using Madagascar to reply to I pet SRI on one acre and we use four metric tons compared to three metric tons from ordinarily planted rice. I'm sure that I was unable to send a thanks and reply to the prolonged illness. Some other farmers who saw my answer, I probably use this better this year. I love this term. I went to receive that annual report, 1998-99, sent by you and found out more about developmental work being done by your organization throughout the third world countries. I appreciate your efforts to help poor market farmers ignored by their own governments. Keep up the good work. Thank you again, your sincerely, we're here. And we have a tour that was born in the public journal article. There was a farmer out in Punjab. He's just reading a few paragraphs on a report. You go and get a one third higher yield than he's already been high yield. And that's pretty significant. So it's a matter of getting the information to farmers, getting them to try it to overcome the hesitancy. In 19. In 1998, we began running a college out of the country to try these methods, da 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 Didn't work everywhere. In Thailand and Nepal, we didn't see the impact. We don't know why. In 2002, we had an international conference in China uh, to assess SRI. It was hosted by the father of hybrid rice, especially Wang Long Ping, the rural hero of agricultural development. We had funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, 10,000 from the World Bank and the of our CFAD money. The reports from 15 countries. The proceedings are all on online. If you want, you can look at them yourself. Both country reports and research reports, lots of eminent researchers. And so the kind of head looked really smooth, clear, but we got resistance emerging, so I'll discuss later. There we go. As a over 65 countries where we've been able to show that these methods will give you a better you know, pipe. The regional networks in Latin America, which is sponsored by the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation for Agriculture, the Sub-Saharan Africa Network based at Kenya University, University in Kenya, and a newly formed Southern Asia Network. And in Asia, we have 10 countries here. Sometimes we do the Lux app and Facebook and other networks to share information. And these countries that are, have demonstrated it, simply they've adopted a knowledge in Tanzania, in northern Vietnam, others have still come up with works. But these countries lose 90% of the world's rights. So we have in progress. I like to emphasize that SRI has been evolving and diversifying all this time. And I have an article in Journal of Agronomy, I call it SRI 2.0 and beyond. SRI 1.0 was the original practice assembled by Father Launier. Um, he crystallized in 1983. 2.0 is modifications to meet local circumstances like range and SRIs and irrigation, direct seed instead of transplanted, recognized that of hand labor. Water depth, so we really cut the water to the minimum. SRI 3.0 is a variety of extrapolations of other crops, wheat, fuel, milk, sugar, and mustard, maize, temp, et cetera. Then when we hired, we going to do the Google Oak production. We're also in human employment in Google. And the space, the space plants also respond to the space and soil development and so forth. As our popcorn is integrated into farming systems, so it's not just monoculture rice. Here's an example of that. 
pipeline are called goal oriented. That's why I work kind of, you know, have climate resilience, greenhouse you know, gas reduction, gender equity, conservation biodiversity, and work in conflict or post conflict situations. And the 6.0 is work in SRI to explain what's going on. The SRI principles in brief are really four. Start with careful establishment plans where advanced studies are exceeded to promote the growth of the roots. Roots are terribly important. As farmers, you look into your plant roots. No, well, scientists don't either, but you should look at the roots. Um, reduce plant density as much as 80 to 90 percent of the higher yields. It's really higher profits. So each plant has good access to nutrients, water, and sunlight, which also reduces many of your pests and disease problems. Maintain an optimum balance of air and water in the soil because plants need both. Too much air and no water. Uh, so you want to optimize air and water in the soil. Fourth, build up the organic matter in the soil to improve the structure and function as well as system and enhance the life in the soil. So I that. The types of this, to be described lots of these, my understanding right now, start with a non cluttered nursery, reduce this area by 80 to 90 percent. a very small nursery. Uh, select your seeds before you sow it because it's very important to have good, vigorous seedlings. Transplant young seeds, 8 to 10, 12 days old, swimming less than 15. Unless it's a cold, if you're in a cold area, then you go up to 15, 18 days, you will still be in the fourth uh, fourth silicone. Um, wide spacing in a square grid sort of plant that's exposed to sun all the way around with those shading, uh, single seeding per hill and planting. Uh, it's very carefully and quickly if you're transplanting. Otherwise, if you're doing direct seeding, you put one or two seeds in the hill instead of three, four, five. Six, uh, you do alternate wetting and drying. So, soil is more aerobic, but you have water. But manage the region with the soil aerating implement. Stir up the topsoil, bury the weeds, uh, and you get more air into the soil. Plus, the nutrient management as much organic matter as possible, sports soil biota. So, your types are paying attention to the growth and performance of roots, to the structure and function of the soil system and to the soil biota. The impacts, again, I've lot these all on the slide, I'm sorry. Higher yields, less water requirements, so you say water, fewer or no purchase inputs to cut costs and raise income. Often, not all, but often lower labor requirements, especially with mechanization. With RAP against SRI, if you start with it's too late to it. Well, that's because if you start in Africa with very labor extensive, any intensification of the work is more, what you get more, you put in labor to protect your land. It turns out even in Madagascar, the article that Chris Barrett and colleagues did in 2003, which showed that you know, SRI was more productive, but very poor people couldn't afford to use their land, their labor to invest in higher yield. To them and, hand them out. and so, in fact, it wasn't benefiting really poor people as much as we hoped. They hoped, everyone hoped. And that was a very valid point. When Chris and his colleagues did this article the next year, where they took a time perspective, it turned out that even in Madagascar, which is very labor extensive, by the fourth and fifth year, it was labor saving. Power managers learning the techniques, getting comfortable with handling young seedlings very quickly. So anyway, labor requirements is something we, 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 we may want to come back to. It's accessible to poor households because there's no cash outlay or very little cash outlay. So it reduce poverty and hunger. There's more gender equity because women's labor is less arduous. Uh, the weeding methods save a lot of time uh, over the hand weeding, which is really debilitating for women over time. Um, we have then oops, that? little or no reliance on fertilizers and chemicals. It's better for soil health, human health, and water quality. 
shorter growing season by five, 10, 15 days. So you can hang you with less time. That's what we're going to study and talk about. It's interesting. And higher milling alternative. So you could take a bag of padding dice, always you can fill them running through your mill, and we're going to put them all over the other. You've got about five, ten, fifteen percent more of your rice to a bag, a bushel, or a kilogram, with less chaff and less unfilled grain. So actually, we're requiring all those padding yields, rough rice, but there's another bonus. I've learned my life as a technical master to show off the two in 2002. Thanks to the host, and my brother to the point of the SI farmers to offer you a rather nice and 10% premium. And who was in the room where he had that 10% more realized for me? He was like, it's, you know, I didn't even have a research study to do that, but it was rice numbers. You know, two to many people in the world. They come all over at the end of the give a hand for the S5 Patty Rice, but you have something going on there. Um, let's fall over the time of climate change hazards, is all water stress, failing to join some animals, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in the United From back to the end, greater nutritional value, more iron, zinc, copper, and manganese, and then less arsenic in the grains, and also less energy contamination. So these are all things that, and they work as a hazardous for virtually all varieties, old varieties, new varieties, hybrids, uh, you, you name it. So there are a lot of reasons why this should uh, succeed, but anyway, we, as I said, we, we thought it was really gonna go well, or as I have quote predicted. Uh, it's, it's gone well in the sense 65 countries is nothing to be ashamed of. We've had very few resources uh, to work with, but still there was a campaign started from the International Rights Search Institute, Erie, uh, discrediting, dismissing us for the article was published in their magazine in 2004, Agronomic UFOs Waste Valuable Research Resources. And the first sentence was, discussion of the system of rice intensification is unfortunate because it implies that SRI merits serious consideration. SRI does not deserve such consideration. And the article went on because they said its main components run directly counter to well established principles for high crop growth. They said, you know, lower plant densities will reduce crop yield. We now know that's not true. Replacing paddy flooding with moist soil conditions will also reduce yield. We know that's not true. Organic vision to the exclusion of mineral fertilizer cannot outyield this mineral fertilizer. Well, we never said it's to the exclusion. You can do it if you want, but farmers don't need to depend upon the purchase of inorganic fertilizer. The closing words of the article were, it is hoped that SRI experience will infuse those making funding decisions for agricultural research with renewed skepticism and caution upon the next sighting of an agronomic UFO, unconfirmed field observation. You know about that, right? The advantage of the article is there's no need for Erie or anyone else to investigate SRI, and no financial resource should be wasted when evaluating it. Now, fortunately, say for SRI, this message didn't get through to a lot of researchers in the global south, particularly China, India, and Indonesia, but also Thailand, you know, other places. So there's a large literature done by researchers almost all in the global south. A couple of studies done in Japan, uh, but not by research in US and Europe, apart from the pieces. There are some pieces I like for my students on this, which we're very pleased to involved in about that. Uh, for the most part, it's been ignored by the scientific community. I just put this up here, talk to her at the ICAR. Institute of Water Management and the SBAR, done a lot of controlled trials, very specified conditions, comparing uh, plant height, root depth, root dry weight for the hill, root dry weight per square meter, root length per hill, root density, et cetera, et cetera. You see, there's some huge 
increases, particularly refers to the root density, root length, root exudation, which means root activity, and the photosynthetic rate almost doubled in the plants. So there's something going on in the plants themselves. Uh, dismissal as far right here is called an article on fantastic yields and system rights densification. Dr. Charles, who would say focus entirely upon whether the highest yields would be reported, as high as 21 tons in one case in Madagascar, even possible. Because when you can't get more than 18 tons per hectare, we've got crop modeling results to show prove it. Um, they raised their results on three small comparison trials, but didn't call an SRI protocol. They put in a lot, three times more nitrogen fertilizer than, than even their own co author had recommended for China. And one of the SRI plots lodged, so its yield was lowered. Even with that, the average SRI yield is higher than their own best management practices. But since it wasn't higher, and SR wasn't better, then the SR was inferior. Uh, and they had a model uh, done by Kim Goldman, research director like Erie, uh, which considered only the rates of rice leaves when you pull the synthesis, and they lost most of the roots to hypoxia. I wrote to, I think was good enough sending the article for feedback and comment, and I said, you know, you may be right, you're the scientist or not, but our plants have very different root systems than the ones that you use for getting your parameters. Don't think it's possible that with a different root system. Norman, this is not about evaluating roots, it's about photosynthesis. I would like to you mean what happens with roots? You have any effect on what goes on in the canopy? You want to answer that. Whoops. Okay. Anyway, um, that then was called the article. Does the system of rights investigation outperform conventional best management? A synopsis of the empirical record published in the field crop research by the Dallow Hops in the year 2006. Uh, this was passed through peer review, so there were substantial flaws in both methodology and the database. The authors wrote that they had included only comparison with SRI trials, quote, closely approximated SRI protocol. So therefore, in any files where they had only two of the six practices, they put those out, but they kept everything with just three of the six practices. Now, how three out of six closely approximates protocol, I cannot understand. But they said, well, we need to have a larger sample. So we couldn't exclude all the ones we might have excluded. In fact, one of the authors even said, about half could not have been included in the database. We published anyway. Uh, the uh, criteria for inclusion exclusion were quite inconsistent. I won't go into those details, but the guys, the intersect of Madagascar, for example, were excluded because it's so as an assessment. Almost all countries have results. Uh, in fact, these were five thousand of the most rigorous testing replications around this uh, field file. These were on stage and files, and also the five most successful, so they were excluded. And so by taking this sort of, I'm not playing a sample, it can prove that less management practice was superior to SRI by 11%. Uh, however, some years later, uh, Wu Wei uh, in China, at the Northeastern Northwestern School of Agriculture, did a meta analysis of all the Chinese study of the SRI, so he could read Chinese and Japanese, apparently. And uh, it was a very thorough one. 26 locations in all the seven major ISO provinces, 64 pairs of trials. And he concluded, in fact, I think the whole sample, SRI was 11% above the MD. So I'm important, the sample could be disaggregated because the, the data were there. And if you took the mostly SRI practices, even four or more, there was a 20% yield advantage over the MD. And there were only about 20% of the sample did the full thing, but that was a 
increase. If you did low SLR, which is one or two, you had 55% disadvantage, which we were predicted because if you put young seedlings or you flood the field, you're going to inhibit the growth of the young seedlings. So this, this very much confirms. I was a co author because I helped write up the article to the good enough to the plantation, the plant and soil. But when we did all the research all the time, the base is going to to do a study. So we think the science of record is, uh, is, is pretty clear, but it's still not. And so we have a very large literature with uh, Lori, referred to over 1,600 published journal articles, and plus 120 species from 40 countries. Uh, so it's the most welcome. And we just formed the Lucy and colleagues on the SRI Global Research Network uh, at the uh, International Rice Congress in Manila last October. And its space is going to have only refereed high quality publications. Some of the things you've are very repetitive and some aren't done very well. But uh, the new group, that's the second one. I want to emphasize there are many substantial subjects of research in social sciences. Right. Science, this is our group at um, the uh, Manila meeting in Chile, India, Indonesia, Iraq, Malaysia, Myanmar, Nigeria, Philippines, UK, the US. Those are the ones who got to the for the other countries as well. Um, this is a, a bit of research. When I came back from Madagascar, first time talking about SRI, I called my friend, I was a friend, and Professor Coffin. Who's the white here? I told him, that's right. He said, you know, Norman, you know, that, that that's some tiller in your reporting. That's really not very helpful because we have evidence that you have more tillers to plant than tiller green to rice for the mechanical kind of grain. That's the word in the literature. So I had data that next season from the 74 farmers up in the Matavaki. And the person who gathered data was really conscious, had a lot of confidence in him. He was a fully very proud of the And I remember we had graphics flying from out of that Indonesia. And I just started plotting 874 um, data points for farmers who had pillars for plant average in grains for kind of got a That should have gone down. I said, wow, oh, that's how you go. So if, you, if you have a negative relationship, you can't do from two to eight times. But if it's positive, then you can. And that literature starts to think about how it's a paradigm shift because of what the scientists in rice science have been doing is using, using the rice as a closed system. So you have more risk, you have less of that. If rice is an open system, you have more of this and more of this. And in fact, what we see with SRI, we have more roots, more tillers, and more grains, even heavier grains. Root systems, in fact, in country up to the end. So it's a, it's a paradigm shift if you think about as right, in the roots and open the roots and grow roots and come from vegetable plants, roots and uh, roots. Yeah. It's, so we started thinking about roots, and then we found an article published in 1974 in the Italian journal Il Riso, which is even in the library. I had to go and get this on interlibrary loan from Minnesota to read it. But you know, what they found was that if you Kept the rice under flooding, continued flooding, by the flowering stage, 74% of the rice plant roots were degraded due to hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Hmm. I remember telling us to Niall Brady, uh, and he was a little bit annoyed that he hadn't seen this article because he thought he was lost the literature on rice. And his response was, well, maybe by that time the plant doesn't need some plants. We're going to argue with the plant. See, 
But, you know, this is one of the plants starting to fill grains and doesn't need as many roots. Gotta be kidding. So, anyway, uh, we had a student doing his thesis, Zuelli uh, Barazon, and he really wanted to go into the roots. And he bring the lines with our sheep had scalpers. Kill and I sat down over a beer one evening, remember? How do you measure roots? You can measure right. You can't look at the hair roots with the microscopic, which is half of the surface of the roots. So you have a lot of ideas. You know, buy a string to the base of the plant, tie that to the marker scale, and tie that to the board. And then you can pour it up the river for watching the rough plant roots. How many kilograms of course to take a root for the plant? You know, when you're a place to talk about that, the line of the, oh, that's how good for your existence. John O'Toole did that here. Can you have a root for your existence? He found that that's why the plants like four to ten times more resistance. And when he told me these results, uh, again, I remember saying, Mr. Ellie, that's great results, but I can't believe that. Let's go to the field and check it out. And he was, his face was very pressful. I didn't believe him. Uh, but, you know, I said, let's go check it out. We walked to about a kilometer to a field where we knew the farmer. They knew, and he wouldn't mind if we pull up some of these rice stumps. And so we went to his neighbor's field. And, you know, I could pull out those pumps. They have four, five, six, seven, sometimes ten plants in a clump. Go to the Fainu's field. I couldn't pull up a single root stump. So I could feel like a little force for one plant versus force I had for three, four, five, and six. So really, because he was really bright, he won the Laureate de Madagascar, which is a award to the best college graduate in the whole country that year. And he came to Cornell with a AID scholarship, did his thesis on SRI, and under very careful and controlled conditions, he showed about a six times increase per plant in the resistance it takes you to pull up the plant. So this really made us more and more uh, interested in the but it also we found uh, article done in 1986 where Michel Poulard at uh, Sirad in France and they get Poulard he points out here I'm going to get it Bites and irrigated by the drugs and then the cross sections on the roots. And you put that up and dry, unplugged, you see it's upper left hand. What you see in your you know, plant biology textbooks. If you plot it, you see it in the cortex around the steel in the middle, so it disintegrates and it creates air pockets, the air pockets, with the air. Circulating through the roots, so the root tips. You can make an irrigated variety of flooded. You see up the right, there's much more degradation of the cortex around the field, and the air pockets are bigger and better. So that kind of rice can appear better under a flooded, hypoxic, anaerobic condition. But if you've got an irrigated variety in the unflooded conditions, that's the cross section. So it looks like that. And you put it up and dry, it does get it. So the formation of the ring, the degradation of the root structure is an adaptation. We're thankful for it. These are rice can be a very productive crop and a pretty good growth. It is a weed. Anyway, I've got to really hurry up and see. Um, the edge is back there. If you've ever done sampling of meals, you're told, don't take your samples from the edge of the field, always go to the middle of the field. So, you put so the plants on the outside of the field, like the All the other is that in the more production. You get more sun, more air, the roots can go out without the competition. And my question is finally, what do you want the edge effect of the field? How can we avoid the edge effect? Well, what is the measurement? Achieve the edge of the whole field. 
That's the last one. That's right. This is one of them. Are there nice roots? We found that, in fact, when farmers did more mechanical weeds in a hole, you got higher yield of bean. Kind of gas up there on the left. No mechanical weeding is still over five times the bean. Over ten times the bean, but four bean. Same thing in Afghanistan. There's 42 farms. And same thing in Madagascar, in Nepal. So this suggests that I could. Active soil elevation could be a good thing. Okay. And uh, I want to give you the sun. You all have access to like the VLI. Greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe you saw you do that. Big issue. Recommendation that go right into a farm in Arkansas at the 1200 acre. That's a high five. He does not translate, but he uses dramatic drill to put a seed with wide spacing, very shallow. Uh, he doesn't get much higher yield than his neighbor for all their costly inputs. He matches yield, but he saves money 20%. So he reads as well. This is one I want to tell you. Alan Hirschman in his book, Song of Hunger, says, as usual, emerging in a particular with the essential potential boost to the general. Which was the other end of the line. As a CPAD gave us faculty, John, Peter, I hear, I see, you know, in the field, not the lives of the economic quality in the literature. Because one thing I've learned from my answer experience is that not all of them is true within the literature. Not all of this in the literature is true. So I'm glad to the university, but the literature, those who are going to use the literature, but don't necessarily believe it. And I concluded an epigram from Douglas Adams, and many will know as an author of Hitchhiker's Night. The galaxy is the widely read writer science fiction, it's also a perceptive author of science. He, as in volume five, so on. This is a character, Dr. Wonka. He says, if he, the scientist, sees a thing, he just say that he sees it. Whether, whether he thought he was going to see or not. Otherwise, you would only see what you were expecting to see. Most scientists forget that. Now, we can read about the last point. There are a lot of scientists forget that. So, Research, science, fills to be encountering the reality, fulfills lots of surprises. The SRI was one of the big surprises, one of the smallest we can find. It's not even a bank holding. He said, We've been saying life for about 40 years, very closely. It's pretty surprising that we have missed this. Well, yeah, but they did. Peace. Working you know, for years with farmers, with plants, something in agriculture that is a really smart way that we do the thing and we try to change the paradigm and not just the rice, but a lot of other crops. Anyway, I love talking for hours. I can. And so that my physical limitation keeps me from coming to campus. Uh, I'm glad to, of course, my email. Uh, you know, Both of us are very willing to share all that we know, and we have got to see some of you here. Um, and you can go to our website, and we'll get lots there, but we're glad to discuss this in the industry. So, you stop. <laughs>